All right, well, I would like to call to order the steering committee meeting, which is a joint meeting of the school board and the city council on Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. Item one is welcome and introduction. So I wanna um, welcome everyone to city hall for kind of a semi-social um, conversation to sort of get to know everyone. There's some new faces on both boards. And I think it's always helpful when you know um, a little more informally some of the people that you need to work with across the city. So that's why we kind of plan this dinner. Um, I certainly want to thank Carol McQuillan. Yay, Yay Carol. <laughs> and common roots for putting on a fabulous meal. So we were fortunate to have her a culinary expertise as well as um, the wonderful food that she grows. It's so good for us and our children and our community. Mm -hmm. So that's lovely too. <coughs> um, so we'll st the next item, I guess, if that's enough. Do you wanna say anything, Kate? I just appreciate us um, being together tonight and thank you um, to Carol and to everyone who's putting the energy to arrange this. Good. Um, so agenda review, are there any additions, deletions or changes in order of the agenda items that anyone has? Okay, well seeing none. Um, are there any comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda? Wendell. Well, I had some mixed messages, but my understanding was that originally this was scheduled as a social of the council and the board with no warning. And I didn't think we were going to talk about football all that time. So I'm very glad that it's now fully open and warned to the public. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, any comments for people who are joining via Zoom? Okay, seeing none. We'll move on to item four, approving the minutes from the July 10th steering committee meeting. Meeting. I would entertain a motion for I, approval or- I would move to approve the minutes. There's a second. Are there any discussion or changes or? All right, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Approve the minutes as presented. <clears throat> so item five is the Kind of the social interaction time, although we had some good conversations as people, I think we're, I mean, with people sitting next to you. Um, but we thought it would be interesting to have everyone just go around the table and introduce themselves and share on what brought them to service in South Burlington. Maybe a little bit of what you've done in the past that you think is, um, kind of frames who you are, if there's been work or travel or <coughs> family or whatever. It doesn't that we don't have to get real into intimate details or anything, but um you know, those kind of general things just so um we all have a context for understanding who everyone is. So is there anyone who would like to start? I'll start. Okay. Thank you, Tim. My name is Tim Barrett. I've been on city council since 2016. I moved up here in 81 to start a job with IBM right out of uh, school. And uh, I was on the DRB for four and a half years before city council. And I was on the library board of trustees for six years before that. <clears throat> so the reason I ran for city council was because of what was proposed to happen right behind us here. Um, there was some turmoil about uh, Central School and an offer made by a developer to pay $7 million for the property. <laughs> there were some plans for City Center, and I just said, I, I'm going to run because this is a discussion I want to be involved in, and I want my vote to be directed. So that's, that's how I, I got started. So but thank you, everybody, for being here, and thank you to Carol. Carol's not here. It was a delicious meal. I appreciate it. Okay. Want to just go around the table then? That sounds good. I'll go okay. Next. Kate Bailey, South Burlington School Board. I um, I moved to South Burlington in 2017 from New York City. I started Vermont being home when I went to St. Michael's and graduated in 2000, 
11, um, grew up throughout New England, um, went to college here, moved away, came back in 2017. And um, my professional background is in healthcare policy and community organizing. And um, I wanted to run for the school board seat after seeing how our schools in particular and our communities have been so impacted uh, by COVID and thinking about learning loss and how closely related um, our healthcare and education systems are to one another and how dependent um, things like mental health services and uh, social emotional learning and our climate change policy and our kids classrooms um, all over overlap with one another. So um, yeah, that, that's a little bit about me. I have a partner, two dogs and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am Megan Emery, I'm on the city council. This is my 14th year. Um, I was raised outside of Chicago in a very political family. Um, and I had uh, my dad from a, a very uh, left-leaning family and my mom from a very right-leaning family. I would say not as right-leaning as they are today in the Republican Party. Um, so more what I'd call the Republican, uh, going back to uh, Abe Lincoln. Um, so we had very boisterous um, conversations growing up and I um, decided to, after uh, thinking about architecture, I decided to go into French studies and to become a professor. So I chose the, the topic, uh, which was existentialist French philosophy, which I teach at UVM. Yeah, I teach French literature from the 20th century through the 21st century. Uh, World War II, thank you so much, Carol. Decolonization. And so the French Republic is something that I have studied in depth. And coming from a very political family and understanding the American Republic um, to, some, to some degree, this was just a wonderful outlet for me. Um, how did I get into it? I was first uh, in the PTO. And then uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, that's when uh, there was a movement uh, to have the school and city budgets put up for a vote. And I was recruited in the effort to make sure that it wasn't three strikes and you're out. You'd have to revert to the previous year's um, budget. And so I was one of those parents that you all know very well, very <laughs> active. And, and then I was um, asked to go into the chart review committee by um, a counselor at the time. And I said, that's interesting to me. So I did that. And then a spat became available on the city council and the same counselor said, you should run for city council. And I did that. So that was in 2008. And I have to say, it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. And um, we have, have at the same time raised three children. The third one is in seventh grade. So I know the city from both the school side and the city side, and it's an amazing place. And I just feel so privileged to be able to call it home. There we go, that's me. Hey everybody, I'm Tim Warren, and this is my, let me check, first day. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, before I tell you how I ended up on the board, um, uh, a little bit about my background. I'm actually a native of Vermont. I grew up in Milton. Um, went to the University of Vermont. I have a German studies degree, so there's in that I'm in good company. area, right? There we you know? go. Um, so after I graduated from UVM, I worked with my father for a while and then ended up uh, bumming around what I wanted to figure out what I want to do when I grew up and ended up as a paraprofessional at South Bronson High School for four years and working in special ed. And so that was that was my favorite job ever, but I sold out to corporate because they just offered more money. So <laughs> and I ended up at IDX for quite a few years as a, a training, believe it or not, radiology software, which I know nothing about radiology, but they, they teach you all of that. And then uh, it turned into basically an instructional design job, and that's what I've done for the last about 20 years. I developed uh, courseware, training materials for radiology, software, cardiology, stuff like that. So how I got into this position? So about a year or so ago, um, I decided I would start attending school board meetings just because I wanted to become more educated on what was happening. I'm one of those community members who lets everybody else do the work and is too busy. And I finally said, well, at least I could, you know, come up to speed on stuff. And uh, 
just started attending meetings. Um, he's been there for, I think I missed two meetings this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm sometimes the only one in the room, but it's been, it's been very, quite a learning experience. And then when the vacancy came about, I was one of the ones who said, hey, you should fill that. <laughs> and then it felt awkward that I should probably apply because I was insisting that it be oh, felt right, you know, right. so, and then here I am. So I'm excited to be on the board. I appreciate the opportunity. There are some great people to work with. It's a great community. I do have three children. One graduated from South Burlington. I have two girls who are juniors right now in the district. So we've gone through the whole system. It's a great district, and I just want to see that continue. Yeah. I appreciate that the, you were one of the members who said fill the seat and then you applied because we had a lot more people say fill than we did apply but <laughs> um i'm chelsea tolling house school board this is my first meeting without my little baby with me in attendance so um i just had a baby two months ago and i was saying that when i was running for the school board seat i had just had a baby three months ago so uh, my oldest is two and my youngest is two months and um, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, We're amazing. Go ahead. <laughs> um, when I became a parent, I just had this overwhelming sense of uh, responsibility for not just my children, but our future generations and children in general and children of our community. And um, I really believe my parental model thus far is to model what I think is, you know, best best behavior. And so volunteering and supporting the community is an important piece of that. So that's the reason I decided to run. I thought that school board members were activists and those are two very different things. So I've learned pretty quickly what school board members actually do. Um, and I'm still happy to be doing it, even though it's not what I thought I was supposed to be doing. Um, just some history. I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, Canaan, Vermont, if any of you know Canaan. Wow. Yep, my best so friend is... North. Yes, it is. Yep. We used to like to say our high school soccer team to warm up for games, we would do a two mile run from Vermont to New Hampshire to Canada. <laughs> we wouldn't tell the other team that it was two miles. We'd make it seem like it was more than that. Um, and my best friend is actually serving on the school board in our hometown now, which is fun. It's just, it's interesting to have conversations with her. Um, that district is one school, K through 12. Um, I think the whole population of the school is probably less than one of our elementary schools. So it's different metrics, but still fun. Um, and I moved to Burlington to go to UVM. I studied microbiology. And then after spending four years in a lab with fluorescent lights, I decided to start a business um, training dogs outside and not be in a lab. <laughs> um, and now I'm thinking about going back. So it's just a little about, about me. Thank you. My name is Andrew Chalnick. Um, like Chelsea, what drives me is really concerned for our kids and future generations. Um, most of my whole life, that concern has kind of been manifested in worrying about environment and ecosystems that support all life. Because without that, nothing else really matters. Um, and when I first got to South Burlington in 18, I immediately joined the energy committee. Um, um, because that was how I thought I'd be able to contribute from that perspective um, to the city. Lo and behold, like a day after I moved here, we learned that there was this massive development proposed down the street and all the neighbors collected and what are we going to do about it? And I got involved in the city um, much more heavily than, than I ever really thought I would, um, immediately from the start. and. Um, realize that there's a real ability to, to make change and to improve things, make make things better. And um, I never thought I'd get into politics, honestly, but through that experience and, and meeting folks and meeting really good people and really um, loving this community, I um, thought, well, you know, kick it up a notch and you know make things make things better from the from the council. And it's been great. Great, I really love it. My background kind of facilitates it my whole life. Yeah, I've been an attorney and an engineer, and so I've got different skill sets that I'm able to kind of apply to the problems that, that we face, and um, it's useful to me. So, yeah, here I am. 
That's great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Violet Nichols, Superintendent of the School District, and um, happy to be here with you all having um, this beautiful dinner. And um, let's see a little bit about myself. Um, I, uh, like many of you, share the belief that um, we live in an incredible city, and I happen to also believe that um, education is the most powerful investment that that I could make um, in in our current futures and um, the futures of all of those students in our community. Um, I think the work of educators is uh, the most important work that that I could be in, and find it extremely rewarding and. Um, supportive of our whole community. I grew up in Virgins, so a very small school mm -hmm. system. And um, I did my undergraduate in Florida, and I was going to go to law school. And one thing led to another, and I ended up getting my master's in education and um, started teaching and have never gone back. Um, I've been a, a teacher and a mathematics instructional coach and consultant, um, curriculum director. Didn't love the principal pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a lot of, um, yeah, um, you know, janitorial, being the nurse, uh, picking up the the, the vomit, <laughs> things like that that were not were not <laughs> as uh, rewarding uh, in every moment. Um, and I've done that everywhere from. California to Vermont to Peru, um, and um, so I, I really, you know, mean it when I say this is a special place to be. Um, let's see, I have two wonderful kids, uh, two cats, one dog, great husband, um, and uh, I think I've checked all the boxes. So, uh, thanks again, everyone, for being here, and I'll, I'll pass to you, Alex. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex McHenry. I'm a school board member. I've been in South Burlington for about 15 years. I'm from the area pretty much, so I uh, grew up here, went to school here, and um, when an opening came up about six and a half years ago, I thought, oh, this would be great. And previously, I had been on the school board in Barry City around the turn of the 21st century, so I served three years there and figured, well, I've got some experience. I could do this, um, so I figured I'd go for it, and I did. I, I enjoyed very much. <clears throat> And I'm um, looking forward to keeping at with it, keeping at it. Um, I've got two kids. I've got a senior and a sophomore. And so I'm very familiar with the schools. If you when I went to the um, some of the school tours that we had a couple weeks ago, I thought, yep, I know this, I know that, because I had been to every single one of them, either as uh, when we had board meetings or summer camps, the schools out summer camp, or just as as a parent picking up my kids at school. Um, um, I'm an avid runner. You might see me out there sweating. And uh, let's see what else. Um, that's about it. Thank you. I'm Sue Alanick. I have taken minutes for this and other boards 42 plus years. <laughs> uh, and the reason I do it is because of people like you. Uh, I like to be around people who are doing something worthwhile, who care, who are passionate keeps me going. <laughs> well, we'll continue the passion to keep you going. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in New York where local government, I grew up in five boroughs of New York where local government was, at least as far as I knew, wasn't. Uh, I never knew that we had one. I presume we did, but uh, it was never something that was accessible uh, or that kids ever learned about or anything. And uh, when I came, I came to UVM as a very young 17 year old uh, and took a course in local government. I didn't know what the words meant. Uh, Alderman, and all, I had no clue, uh, but I have a degree in English, which I did know, and a master's degree <laughs> in English. And, Two thirds of a doctorate and a couple of things, but uh, I love what I do. You could still finish your thesis. <laughs> no, <laughs> I would rather write. I have written three books. I would rather write cookbooks and write poetry. Thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs> Sue. Um, I'm Jesse Baker. I serve as your city manager. Um, I've been here for about two and a half years. I am a Vermonter as well. I grew up in Waterbury Center and graduated from Harwood. Um, 
and then went and got an undergrad degree from Columbia University in psychology and anthropology and a master's in policy and planning from Tufts. Um, I started my career in child welfare, so I was a foster care caseworker in New York City for a couple of years and worked in child welfare in Boston and really thought my career was going to be about changing the child welfare system and making um, children and families as healthy and as successful as they could be, especially those of our kiddos who don't have a biological link necessarily to their families. My fatal flaw in that was that nobody pays you to change the child welfare system. <laughs> <laughs> so I got into program evaluation. I took a lot of statistics courses in graduate school and really loved that and found myself, as you were saying, Chelsea, sitting in a high rise in downtown Boston, analyzing data from a child welfare agency. It was just so far away from community. Um, and I was living in Somerville, Massachusetts at the time and really loved that community. Somerville is to Boston as Winooski is to Burlington in a lot of ways. Um, and wanted to work on community. So went to do program evaluation for the city of Somerville. It's a city of about 80,000, 100,000 people. Um, so I worked there for five years. I was the human resources director. I was the mayor's political aide. Um, I was a data analyst and then wanted to move back to Vermont. So came home in 2011, been here since. I've been the assistant city manager in Montpelier, the manager in Winooski, and I've been here for two and a half years. I also was realizing when I was telling this story, Violet very kindly invited me to her leadership team meeting this week. And um, a connection I hadn't made before was that my, my mother went back to school so my father was the chief of child care licensing for the state for his career, and my mom was the daycare center director and a kindergarten teacher. And then when I was in middle school and high school, went back and got her doctorate at UVM um, and taught students how to be elementary school teachers. And she supervised student teachers at Harcott and Orchard in uh, Chamberlain for about eight years. So I remember coming home from college and hearing stories about Marcotte and the teacher she was meeting at Marcotte and what their experiences were um, and actually did her dissertation on teacher retention um, featuring teachers at Marcotte, um, which is really interesting. And I hadn't yeah. intellectually put that together until I was talking to your team. Then. Yeah, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so, anyway, that's me. I'm really thrilled that we're having this conversation tonight and um, love being here and being part of this team. Thanks. Great. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Walk. I get serve a dual role as your deputy city manager and your fire chief. Um, I'm native here in Vermont. I spent the last, uh, last 32 years in the professional fire service, uh, 25, about 25 of those in White River Junction where I spent most of my career. The last, I spent seven years as the fire chief for the city of Burlington and then about 18 months or so came over here. Uh, I've been married for 32 years to an educator who is a principal in a neighboring district. Uh, so I hear a lot about the educational system and, um, and we have two grown children. So, uh, so I, I'm you know, very privileged to work for Jesse. And I think, you know, as someone who's, I've worked for the manager form of government, I worked for the mayoral form of government. And when the opportunity came to come over here and help, you know, help us uh, right the ship on some struggles we were having, it was a great place to come to. So that's me. So Larry Kupferman, my first meeting. So I uh, moved to um, South Burlington in 1976 um, and um, have been very active in Burlington for a long time. Uh, my, my work primarily was with Champlain Valley OEO doing anti-poverty work. Uh, my interests in South Burlington and during retirement, which has been these past few years, is really affordable housing mm -hmm. and conservation. Mm -hmm. And um, those two things sort of butt heads quite a bit. So there's some tension there, um, mm -hmm. as always, but good tension, really. Um, um, we've had our two daughters went to South Burlington schools. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say, um, I can't remember what I was going to say, but that, that, should, that should be plenty. It'll it come back. back. It, may, it may or may not come back. <laughs> <laughs> great. Okay. It's great to be with you. Okay. I'm thrilled that we're all together. This is great. Um, I'm Helen Reilly, and I chair the city council. I've been on, this is my 12th year on the council. Um, prior to that, um, I was in the legislature. Well, I worked on a in a couple um, healthcare nonprofits. 
one on quality improvement and one on um, encouraging young people to look at healthcare as a career and supporting their experiences and and also helping um, allocate some state dollars to uh, help retain primary care and psychiatrists and nurse practitioners in the state of Vermont um, with some help with their um, debt, their school debt. Prior to that, I served in the Senate for eight years, representing Chittenden County, except Colchester. Um, and then before that, I was in the House for 10 years. Um, at that point, I lived in Burlington. Um, and then, then we moved here and I, I uh, ran for Senate. And before that, um, I was a teacher for about 10 years in middle school. I worked in South Royalton Elementary High School, mm -hmm. um, a little K through 12 <laughs> kind of situation. Um, and then I worked at Camel's Hump Middle School, which is the age group that I really loved was middle school. Um, when I got into politics, it was sort of worked well because um, I had children at the time. I have three daughters and I could in the legislature, you know, you're just there for like six months. So the other six months when you weren't running for re-election, mm -hmm. I could be home with my children. So that sort of worked really well for our family. Um, clearly I'm married and, and um, to the same guy. We um, <laughs> celebrated 51 years, which was sort of unusual in his family because both of his parents were married four times. Each. Um, so we were setting a new record. <laughs> not copy an old one anyway. And um, and then when I um, kind of left this, the, the Senate and and and, and the, the nonprofit organizations, um, my husband said, oh, there's an opening on the city council. You should run. It's only two meetings a, a month. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, but you know what? I'm not gonna campaign because I'm just tired of campaigning. I've done it so many times. So if I get elected, great. If I don't, you know, I think, well, I, I did get elected. You ran on a and, post. Um, right, yeah, I ran on a post, so it was pretty easy. Um, and then it turned out it was a lot, a lot more than two meetings a month. But I would say um, I, I enjoy this far more than any of my legislative experiences, because this is, kind of right where it happens. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can recall my some of my first meetings and it was kind of like, oh, we're gonna vote on this tonight? Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't six months of testimony. Um, <laughs> it was like a little bit of testimony maybe. And then you make the decision and then it, it gets um, enacted or carried through um, with city government in a way that state government um, isn't quite as efficient, I guess. There's so many steps to go through to really have a piece of legislation become what really happens. So I find this really fascinating and um, satisfying. And I would agree with everyone. This is a you know wonderful city to work for and with and I'm you know very happy with sort of how we're moving and I look forward to helping that along. Um, I am not a native though. I grew up in New Jersey and when I came to UVM I can remember distinctly the first weekend um, I said man I hope if I find someone I want to marry, they want to stay in Vermont because this is where I'm <laughs> So that worked out. <laughs> Good evening. My name is uh, Sean Burke, and I have the privilege of serving as the city's police chief. I spent the last 30 years in Vermont law enforcement, starting at the Woodstock Vermont Police Department with five members. I did about two years there, and then I did uh, the better part of 22 years with the city of Burlington Police before uh, being hired as the city of South Burlington Police Chief in 2018. 
I'm married to a career nurse, a woman that I met in the emergency room at UVMMC <laughs> while we were at work. We have two sons. They uh, went K through eight at St. Francis Xavier School in uh, Winooski, where I served on the school board for a number of those years. They're now, one is a sophomore at Norwich, the other is a junior at Milton High School. And uh, disappointing football season, looking looking forward to a great hockey season. They didn't have football when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a game. No pun intended. But, and uh, I guess just a reflection on local government, I do like we're able to actually move the ball on the field. And that's uh, having spent Unfortunately, a lot, a great amount of time testifying before the legislature and seeing how slow that process is mm -hmm. and how unpredictable some of the outcomes are. I really appreciate uh, how nimble a local government can be. Great. Well, and Tom's here, and then Violet does have some stuff online too. I don't know if you want to have them introduce themselves as well. So Tim Jarvis sure. is on, and Patrick Burke, and then Tom's here in the audience. Okay. Right. Yeah. Patrick, you want to start? If I can figure out how to unmute myself, can you I'm hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm Patrick Burke. I've been working at South Burlington. It's my 27th year at the high school. I've been principal for 23 of, this is my 23rd year as uh, school principal. Um, I feel very strongly about the education that um, is provided to our youth pre-K through 12 in South Burlington. I'm proud of our accomplishments, but also uh, pretty focused on improvement and seeing how we can get better as um, our students certainly deserve the very best. So I'm just kind of lurking this evening. So uh, <laughs> I wasn't really ready to introduce myself, but uh, thanks okay. for giving me that opportunity and uh, appreciate you letting me join uh, virtually tonight. Great, thank you. And Tim Jarvis? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Um, thanks for uh, letting Pat go first, because I wasn't ready to say anything e either. But um, I'm the Senior Director of Finance and Operations for the school district. I was born in South Burlington, went through the whole school system, uh, there was no K back then, so I have to say it was only one through twelve. But I went to uh, I went to Rick Marcotte School when Rick Marcotte was still the uh, I think principal at the middle school <laughs> before he got uh, his principal <laughs> job. But uh, in any case, um, uh, very deep roots with the community. My father was on the first city council when it when it went from transferred from being a town to a city and was very much instrumental in local politics and, and, and civic groups and policy making. Um, he thinks that South Burlington has become much more complicated since then. <laughs> and he gives me a lot of anecdotes about what it was like in the early 70s to run this city, which is very different than it is today. But anyway, um, I left South Burlington to go to college, went to Dartmouth, went in the Peace Corps, taught for two years in Africa. Thought I would be a nonprofit my whole life. Instead, I got recruited by Morgan Stanley to start up their operations in Luxembourg. So I kicked off a, a 34 year career with uh, uh, leading financial institutions. I asked my boss if I could move to Vermont during COVID. She said yes. I bought a house. Um, and uh, I needed to find a place to. Um, uh, pretty quickly because I have twin girls who at that time were about to go into sixth grade. And so we closed on our house, I think on August 12th, and they had to start school two weeks later in the middle school. After having attended private Catholic school in New Canaan, Connecticut. So the transition from that, where they had been going to school one class per grade, with the same girls, you know, for 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 K through uh, five, uh, stepping into the middle school was a huge transformation for them, and I'm very proud that they've embraced it. They're now in eighth grade, um, and uh, I decided uh, after taking a summer off, <clears throat> trying to figure out what I was going to do in my life with, with the rest of my career after having left the corporate 
uh, whirlwind and I saw Violet's advertisement in her newsletter for this job for finance and operations. And although I had absolutely no experience in public policy, governance, administration, education, construction, <laughs> or any of those topics, I thought I must have some transferable skills that I can apply somewhere because I love this city and, and I want my my girls to enjoy the same level of of wonder and excellence um, that I enjoyed when I was going to school here. So um, Violet uh, convinced me it would be a good a good match. And uh, next week is my one year anniversary. So I'm very happy to be here and happy to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Any little follow ups anyone has? Something that they gotta get Tom now. Oh, Tom, you oh, can get Tom. Yeah, yeah. He's um, another local guy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Tom DePietro, uh, Director of Public Works. Uh, I've been with the city just under 18 years now, uh, but in the Public Works Director role for just under two years. Uh, I would say what brought me to public service is probably an um, example set by my parents. So uh, my mother was active in our local PGA, um, though at the time I accused her of doing it just to keep an eye on me. Um, <laughs> she really enjoyed that. And my, my father was very involved with youth sports and uh, from Otley's tracking dog, uh, hunting community, things of that nature. So um, I really enjoy working with the community where I can envision a project or take the vision that you all lay out um, and take that sort of from a soup to nuts, start to finish, Kind of final construction, um, be able to stick with it uh, through maintenance as well, um, ongoing maintenance as well. So, uh, yeah. okay, good. Any other little comments anyone wants to make? There's something in your bio that was important. Okay, the exceptional group of humans. Yeah, yeah, no, it's impressive. So, our fifth, no, our sixth item is to discuss some shared values around. Uh, community and school safety. I'm not exactly sure who wants to um, start that. I know you might, but, oh, oh, God. but I don't know. I mean, I could kick it off. I wasn't intending to. <laughs> or, you know, maybe I mean, I think we all of us um, want our kids to be safe, right? That's obviously a common goal. Um, and I would love for us to make some progress tonight. Um, um, breaking through some of the stalemates and, and making progress on, on other things that haven't been stalemate, but maybe you're going a little slower than the community likes. And, and I know we've been all working hard on it, but it'd be great to make some progress. But from my perspective, um, there's kind of two goals. One, kids, kids need to be safe when they get to school. And I, I wanna be able to, um, Want to be safe for kids to to walk and and ride their bikes right because there's a lot of other um goals that we're trying to accomplish as a community and those that that satisfies those goals and how do we how do we make that happen they both have to be safe and parents have to perceive that it's safe and for that to happen it needs to be safe to cross major roads like kennedy and dorset and Pineberg and you know shelburne and so um we we need together to break that stalemate and make sure that it is safe for um, children to be able to do that. I have some own thoughts, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on from here. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, I'd like to um, thank Andrew in particular for um, working with me personally and, and together as a sort of collaboration on our shared values of um, how the city and schools, I think, I don't take for granted that we're all on the same page working towards um, a city and a planet that is livable for our future and, and to try to combat uh, the impacts of climate change that are already so present in our lives. And um, I really appreciate um, the work that and the, the conversations that we've had, particularly how like the, the city's climate action plan and bike ped and the school districts all sort of overlap. And we really wanna um, build on that work together and not duplicate resources and tap into the expertise that we share in our cities and um, in our community. 
And so I just want to back up and share a little bit of a timeline from my perspective. When um, students and parents and, and staff raise the issue of um, street safety, and in particular, my familiarity in this conversation was um, you know, the, fo the four-way inter the intersection right out front here at City Center with Rick Marcotte. Um, I am not, I don't pretend to be a street um, expert or have any sort of expertise in, in infrastructure, but I, I care about the issue and, um, you know, was listening to our, our constituents. And um, we had a community member who's, who's here tonight, I recognize you over here, mention um, complete streets and um, safe routes to schools. So I started doing a little bit of research after I think our January um, 2023 meeting where we had sort of discussed this for the first time at a steering committee meeting. And um, <clears throat> since that seed had been planted, I had, um, and we've had ongoing conversations, I reached out to our neighbors and um, advocates at Local Motion just to figure out what was happening and, and what this looks like in other communities and sort of tapping into the expertise of this wonderful nonprofit that I'm a tandem bike rider and so Local Motion is where you go to ride tandem bikes and so that's why I love Local Motion so much. Um, <laughs> and my partner and I ride tandem because obviously we need a partner too. Yeah, <laughs> um, so local motion has this level of expertise and coordination that I think uh, South Burlington could really take advantage of, and they have already um, they, they've already done so much technical assistance and work in Shelburne, in Burlington, and I've shared. I don't know if I've shared with everybody in this room, but I've shared with multiple people in this room. They're sort of. Um, they have a travel plan that looks at Burlington in particular, most recently, just in the last year. Um, and they're taking a really comprehensive view of um, what it means for children and families to get to and from schools. Um, it's sort of the same way that we'd envision city planning or master planning with the bike ped, but through the lens and prioritizing our students. And um, I think that their model and their expertise is is something that we could really take advantage of. I also really appreciate that they um, have paid staff to coordinate this and are, are sort of neutral experts with all of our best interests in mind, in my opinion. Um, so they have in Burlington a Safe Routes to Schools Task Force, and this model brings together folks like DPW, um, the police department, our school principals and administration, and city council and school district to sit together at a task force that is facilitated and managed by uh, local motion. And it has two sort of prongs, one being infrastructure and um, what I think of as like the public works piece and you know crossing guards and intersections and uh, crosswalks. And then the other wing is um, education and safety and planning events like um, walking to school days and um, doing that sort of education piece and it's happening at the same time in a coordinated effort. I think this is really important also because none of this comes for free. It all becomes with um, budgetary asks and priorities from the community. And I think having all of that coordinated together by local motion gives us a, an opportunity to um, work collaboratively from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I know there's been a lot of back and forth and a lot of conversations at other steering committee meetings over email. Um, my offer or, or my suggestion moving forward would be for us to collaboratively establish this, this task force and, um, and then lean on those experts and um, follow through with the recommendations of, of said task force. Mm -hmm. That's my idea. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that too. And um, that uh, is something that that idea came from a conversation that Je um, Jesse and Helen and Kate and I had as a, a city school team. Um, I was um, doing some reflecting this evening and um, I, I think, um, you know, Andrew and I were saying, we, 
we all have the same goals here and we share, we serve the same constituents. And, and I don't doubt for a minute that everyone in this room wants all of our uh, community members and our students to, to be safe and to have a more walkable and bikeable city. And um, my hope too is this evening we can come together and, and find a way to you know, continue to make progress. Um, I I realize, um, you know, something I shared with Megan the other day is, for some of you, this is a fresh conversation. And for me, uh, my heartstrings have been pulled because uh, since I started in this position, so for about a year and a half, um, some of the first meetings I had were with parents who were really deeply concerned and worried about their kids. Um, and then as construction um, begun and has continued, the concern that we've heard on the school side has been palpable. And, um, you know, we've uh, really, for the last year and a half, tried to work with, with families. And, um, you know, I brought this to, to Jesse in August. We had, um, uh, you know, parent community members asking about lighting and school streets on Dorset. And, you know, at the time we said, you know, the lighting is in line with our the, the climate action plan and, um, you know, school zones, we've gotten so used to this nimble environment that we live in that many of us discussed. And, um, you know, this process of together developing um, safer routes to school for our, our community isn't as nimble. Um, and um, yet I appreciate the forward progress and the partnership, um, you know, as the city does change, um, that we work together to make some of those changes. Um, but, um, so, uh, let's see, I, um, I, yeah, I appreciate the resources. Jesse brought safe fruits to school to our attention, um, and I shared a lot about the bike and ped committee that the city had. And so we've really, um, tried to, um, to work to develop those routes for our schools as well. Our school administrators are doing incredible jobs. And, you know, I want to thank all those in the city who are working to support that. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of progress with um, the funding of the temporary traffic monitor at Marcotte during construction. Um, and- Has um, one been found? Because I drove through it today and I, I saw the principal and I, I saw Sue Conley. Yeah, so um, the person who was in the role um, I, uh, was um, overwhelmed by the anxiety of traffic management, and um, so you know we've we've drawn this distri distinction. So um, at this point, um, I think there's um, th we're finding that um, we're we're kind of burning through crossing guards because what we need are people who are able, trained in traffic control. And that's what we've been hearing from our staff. And that's been um, a difficulty. And we don't have anyone on our, on the school side who um, understands or has expertise in traffic management. If it was curriculum development, I could coach it. <laughs> but um, we found that we've been, um, you know, the staff that we are able to recruit um, are, are um, haven't had that um, expertise and um, so that's some training that um, you know and we've suggested you know hey we've, we've thought about you know we've talked about this so many different ways and you know in in reading the steering committee meetings uh, minute meetings from January we talked about hey the school could staff and um, recruit traffic uh, crossing guards at the time and then we said actually you know, they really need to be traffic monitors off the back of feedback from employees who are saying hey we're really out here putting our bodies in front of cars and we said okay you're right so we modified job descriptions and um, you know, now um, it's it's to the point where we think, you know, as a school side, you know, we're happy to talk about cost sharing, but, you know, not seeing that it's made sense given the staffing patterns to have them on our side. Um, so um, you're, we're again looking for a traffic monitor at Marcot, um, which is a concern of, for parents, you know, because they're watching this school, um, you know, just it's in the middle of obviously a lot of active construction so um, and the sidewalks are um, cut off and so um, we hear you know you're gonna have to forgive my frankness and in, in correspondence we are hearing from just really concerned parents and 
um, you know, looking for this team to come together to find some solutions and a path forward. So um, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that we can continue to make some forward progress tonight. And I, I, I think the um, Action Force is a, a really great way for the two teams to um, collaborate under facilitated expertise, which I understand does not come at an increased cost for the city or the district, correct? So that's another benefit there. The task force. Um, the task force, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I, I think, um, you know, that's a nice option and our neighbors have benefited from it. So I think the, the way has been paved for us in a lot of aspects. I appreciate that suggestion, Kate. So have, have, we, um, have we had a chance to contact the builders? And they the they builders, bear no responsibility in this matter. Yeah, in, in they- fact, It's their construction that is keeping this keeping us safer, a safer, in my opinion. Yeah. And the other thing about traffic is you need to, you need to have somebody who enforces traffic. I mean, I don't I want to say a policeman, but but somebody who has all the gear and the, the sign and the equipment, the yellow, everything, just like traffic control does. They're wearing they're wearing it. They're doing yeah. All that stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. There were two out there. I, I had two questions in my response to Sue yesterday that I, I so the one was answered now about the, um, the crossing guard. Second was the, the path that had been, um, you know, agreed to uh, between the principal of Central and and our our city staff. So there's that path that's right behind the new construction, mm -hmm. right over there. Is it still being used? So we've had a lot of iterations. Um, so. Snyder Braverman um, yeah. has been fantastic. Um, they have been extremely attentive to um, to school safety and worked with uh, Lissa, the principal of uh, Marcot School, significantly. Um, they are uh, they're concerned about so the path is has been many different things, many materials. It's it seems to be open, closed, and they're finding different ways. Um, I think it's closed the right now. Is they or the Snyder Braverman have been finding different ways? The there's been a lot of different um, ways that kids have gotten to school because sidewalks have been closed off or reopened in a lot of different areas. So the path that we're referring to is um, has not been open consistently during construction. So depending on where they are in staging. Um, Snyder Braverman approached Lissa um, this week. Um, Lissa and I talked on Tuesday and she said they're wanting to write a letter. They want to, um, they're concerned about um, traffic. And- so um, Lissa wanting to write a letter? No, Snyder no, Braverman approached, approached, approached Lissa, yeah. And um, they're trying to reach out to Green Mountain Flaggers. They're they're concerned mm -hmm. about the lack of traffic um, support and um, uh, on Market Street. And for, for, for their heavy equipment. For, for their equipment. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's the the drivers of the heavy equipment are concerned about the children and the traffic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Snyder Braverman is concerned about um, student welfare as the focus, not not their employees. They've been they've been extremely attentive to the student and staff needs, um, and so they're worried, sort of, with the nature of Rick Marcotte being boxed in by construction, um, what they described as a, a lack of of safety precautions, and and that's what we're hearing from parents as well. Um, so. Um, they, I think they were working on some correspondence that they were going to share. Um, but, you know, as you described, Larry, we're, we're, we've found that we're not able to attract or retain people for the traffic monitor position because we're mostly dealing with educators, right? Like someone who might serve as um, an interventionist in our system for part of the day and then a traffic monitor and others. And um, they don't, we, we cannot provide the training or the outfitting you know, that's necessary so um those are those are concerns of ours as well so is um schneider braverman looking to the um flaggers you know the ones you see to hire them or are they um believing that the school or the city should be hiring them yeah we have i haven't discussed that mm -hmm. with them at all they Alyssa brought it to my attention 
um, they just felt that the support was that needed. So, an yeah, and, and you know, so I've, I've been engaged in no conversations about finances, but for me, it's really the safety issue sure. that I want to solve first. Um, so, but um, I'll certainly share out in, any additional information I get on that. Mm -hmm. Another question I had, and I, I had posed it, and I think it was a no at one point, but I'm going to ask it even still, um, is there is a driveway that goes to Williston Road. Why is that not being considered? Why, why has that been taken off the, the table? I don't know the answer to that. Um, is that the, so is that the driveway that goes through uh, the florist? No, nope. it just it's yeah. just on the west side of Rick Marquardt. It just it along the west side. Across it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it goes straight to Williston Road. And to my mind, and I was in civil engineering before studying French existentialism. Mm -hmm. um, to my mind, it was solid waste management that stopped me. But anyway, <laughs> also, but, yeah. and now I love it. Now, yeah. anyway, we all get there eventually. We get back to those fluorescent light lamps. Um, so that uh, th that that's the question I have. Is it? you know sitting there in traffic you know trying to come west on market street i could see i could see sue conley i could see lissa mcdonald and i saw people moving in and people moving out and to my mind if we just keep the flow moving one way it would just make it so much less kind of scary because you could see sue's not comfortable i mean that was obvious she's not comfortable and i felt for sue um and she's doing it obviously because she cares and, and, she, and you can't find somebody else to do it um, but to my mind, just getting that one-way traffic flow would resolve so many issues. Yeah, is there someone here who has expertise on that? I, I don't know the answer to that. So I think that's a great idea, and I think we should definitely think about the orientation of Marcotte to Williston Road. I guess I would like to, I, I, I feel a little bit like this is the elected officials conversation, so if there are elected officials who want to speak first and then i'd like to can... abstract away a little bit just from rick Marcotte, because clearly i mean it is but i think probably that's the, most, the catalyst i think no, it's the catalyst. I, yeah but but it's but it's, this it needs to be a broader conversation i mean rick Marcotte needs to be solved but it's also transitional and temporary and it will you know we'll, we'll get there but there's lots of other hot spots around this to do that needs to be addressed and um i'd love for us to all agree that um we need traffic monitors or crossing guards at various spots around the city. And I'm going to take you up on something you said and throw out that personally, I'd be happy for um, the expense to be shared from the two budgets so we can get away from who pays for an issue mm -hmm. and just, you know, drill down into, you know, who's best place to really train, hire and fire and monitor and place these folks and that's a conversation i think probably can happen away from the council mm -hmm. with the experts and kind of break the stalemate that way like abstract away from the budget questions let's just agree to share it and then have the experts agree on on who the who should own the employer relationship so we can get back to the community and say we're going to have you know your kids can be safe we're going to have traffic monitors crossing guards and this is what we've agreed i have to say and i've said this in an email I see it at the elementary school and I, you know, having the kids, my kids go through Chamberlain, we had a crossing guard and there still is a crossing guard. Um, I don't see it at the middle school, high school. And the reason why is they're going to be driving when they're 16. And if people cannot manage to use the crosswalks and the lights, and I have tried on Shelburne Road and it's very safe. It's the cross, it's the curb cuts that are not the safe parts. And You'd need to have i don't know how many crossing guards to help people get across curb cuts okay so to my mind our lights are safe and we're going to be placing in these children's hands at the age of 16 car keys and if we do not expect them to be able to navigate crosswalks with crossing lights at the age of 12 i think that we are not giving them the responsibility that we should be giving them. And it is a philosophical question. Um, and I, I shared with everybody after um, Kate sent the, um, the local motion study, um, just an article that, that happened to land in my inbox on a movement um, that started some years ago 
where parents very concerned about the level of anxiety, increasing level of anxiety in children and in teenagers, uh, that they, they started to um, sense that it had to do with too much parenting and too much concern for their children's safety. That if we can empower our young people when it's age appropriate to take age appropriate risks, like pushing a crosswalk button, waiting for the crosswalk signal and crossing the road, and all of our crosswalks have adequate time for you to get across the road, um, that that would be giving the students and these young people, who again, we're gonna be giving them car keys when they're 16 years old, um, giving them a sense of, I can do this and I can, I can navigate. I can navigate in my city, I can navigate and I have my 11 year old, now she's 12, but when she was 11 and I trained all my kids to do this, I live off of Myers Court, okay? On Myers Court, I walk them to school. The two boys got to the point where they could walk themselves to school, but they also learned to cross Williston Road before the wonderful crosswalk that we have now, to cross Williston Road on their own, to go on Ruth and on Heath and then, Actually, no, it was another road that cut through St. Vianney. I did this with them. I Davis trained them. So, yeah, you know what I'm talking Davis about. Parkway. Thank you, Davis Parkway, that you can cut through to St. Vianney's parking lot. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the entrance to St. Vianney's and it goes to, to Barrett Street. And then you go down Barrett Street and you have the, door, the back door entrance into the middle school, high school campus. I taught them at a young age to do that. I taught them to look both ways. I taught them to be careful. And they did it from, I would say, 11 years old, that they got themselves to summer camp. And at, I don't know, they're probably 13 years old. I said, okay, you wanna go see a movie? Here are bus passes. Cross Williston Road. Again, there, there were, right now it's amazing, okay? I press a button, the car stop, I walk across. Um, at the time you had to look <laughs> and to make sure you go across the street, you wait for the bus at the bus stop, they had their bus passes that their mom had given them. They had, you know, the timetable. They knew when the buses were going to come. They rode down to Majestic 10, watched their movie, got back to the bus stop, and came home. So, Megan, I think that the reason why I like the idea of the task force is because it has this dual infrastructure education component. So, um, the the pop-up events, teaching kids how to do exactly what you're talking about, and for for families who may not have time or energy or understanding to provide that education, that is something that the the task force I think would include and incorporate. Good. And I, I hear that. I'm not a parent, but I have lived in a, a lot of cities, and and I think that one of the best ways that, that and local motion actually I think shared this perspective. One of the best ways that kids and humans can gain independence is by walking and biking. I think it's a fabulous way to connect with your community and um, build the independence that you're talking about. And I'm not a parent, but I would, I would not walk or bike on Dorset Street. And I refuse to endorse that campaign while the speed limit on Dorset Street is 35 miles per hour. It needs to be 25 miles per hour. And we need to have a school zone in yeah. order to um, then be able to invest in um, the education and the independence that you're talking about. Okay. Again, my daughter, 12 years old, with a girlfriend, walked from the middle school down Dorset Street to Umal. All right, so they crossed. Then they went from U Mall to the library, and then they walked home, okay? It is doable. It truly is doable. You just have to know where the crosswalks are, how to press a button, you wait for the cars to stop, and you cross. It is doable. And I, I, I sense that, you know, um, it's something you may not have tried. And I, I walk on this road to get home. And I, I, do not find that sidewalk unnavigable. And I, I simply, I want you to try it before you say, we can't let our students do it. Because I so, do it. Chelsea, did you wanna? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Great. So I actually walk to the middle school frequently from my house on Swift Street. Great. And Swift Street does not have a sidewalk. So when I have my strollers or whatever, I'm like running up the hill as fast as I can to get onto the bike path. And um, the Kennedy Dorset intersection 
the speed limit is what it is, but it also goes to 189, which has a 55 mile per hour speed limit. And people who are using that connection, and this is just my opinion, are in a hurry to get somewhere. And that's the quick connector from one side to the other side. And I have had strollers and bicycles and I have multiple times have had adrenaline rush panic attacks because I think that my stroller is going to get hit by a car and I'm not an anxious person. I'm really not. Mm -hmm. And my other thought or, or con contribution is it sounds like your children are very like privileged and lucky to have a mother like you who will teach them and has the time to teach them. And that is not representative of all of our students or all of our young citizens not not all of them have someone who can teach them and show them mm -hmm. not all of them have the the same um capacities that perhaps your children have yeah. and so i i want to advocate for the safest safest possible option for all of our citizens mm -hmm. and 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 make it accessible and i love the education that you're talking about i completely agree with that parental philosophy um, but let's make sure that the framework that you're teaching on is as safe as it can possibly be, mm -hmm. not just good enough. Well, I think our lights are, but I would say the school district provides school buses. And that's also a very liberating thing for a student. Like cooking your own dinner is a liberating thing for a student. It doesn't only have to be what my children have done on the roads. Sure. They've cooked dinner. I mean, there are things that we can do as parents that don't necessarily you know, require you to teach them like I taught my children to do, because we have school buses. I mean, we but do have other ways. Not all parents are home all day. In, or like not that you're I home all day. Yeah. You're not home all day. That's not what I'm saying. But like some students have to get themselves up and out the door and to school all on their own. That's a lot of independent learning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not due to a lack of caring from their parents. It's just the reality of, sure. their, of their situation. So right. I think Jesse would like to make a comment. So I, I'm I'm so excited that you all are talking about the safe routes to school concept. I know that that's something that we've been talking about for a while, and I think the introduction of local motion into that conversation is really interesting. I work with them a lot in Winooski and they are great facilitators of community conversation and the, you're absolutely right that that combination of education and infrastructure is really powerful. Um, I think standing up a task force, like a, a joint task force, as you suggest, would be a really exceptional idea and, and even more so because I think a lot of the conversation we're having is really in the, in the like technical expertise that Tom and his staff team staff have about intersections and lights right now. I think the reality is our infrastructure is really safe. Um, I think that there's a perception that, that there's not safety. And so how do we as two elected bodies and two CEOs help change that conversation around the perception and make people feel and engage in their own safety in the community? I also think it's really important for us to keep in mind that we can't focus on just what's on the street right now because that's going to change dramatically in the next five to 10 years. So thinking about the, the bike and ped changes that are gonna happen in city center in addition to the housing construction, the commercial space construction that's going in. You know, we're gonna have a shared use path on Williston Road. We're going to have a boardwalk to city center park. That's gonna be a great cut through for students to the back of the high school property. We're gonna have Garden Street open. I think if we had a task force like that, that was really thinking about not only what we need now, how we get through the const those construction phases and what it looks like in 10 years, um, would be really powerful if we could all do that together and walk through those stages together. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of change and it may that change may open up options for perceived safety in ways that we don't know right now, so we can't make decisions about it tonight. But if we stood up this kind of task force that had leaders from um, from both sides of our house um, and community members and you know, Principal Burke or students or think or folks on the on the task force, then we could do that education infrastructure impro impro improvement. And what I think of as like little c, little d community development. So we're partners in safety. We're not directing each other in safety. So how do you? What's the next step to sort of pull that together? Do you and um, Violet sort of come up with this is someone on my team or these are two people or um, I mean, I for one would support that. I, I don't know if you need action from the council or the school board to say, 
yeah, go do it, or if we can just sort of nod our heads and say, well, that makes sense. Why don't we um, pass you two or whomever to pull it together? I don't know what this other task force in Burlington, who was on it, but um, you know that might be a, a model where we can just come up with our own. I mean, I don't think it's um, you know too difficult to sort of figure out eight people or whatever the right number is to be on the task force to represent the the different um, constituencies or stakeholders. And if you pull it together and you've missed someone, you can always add them. Our bike and pet committee, I would hope, would have somebody who could be part of that. And we have had local motion work with at least Chamberlain School. I don't know um, because Chamberlain School has been trying to develop that, you know, safe uh, bike and, and ride to walk and ride to school. Mm -hmm. And they actually have drop offs like, you know, the park and rides where parents, I don't know how many times because it's been a while since my kids have been there, but. Um, where the parents would drop their kids off, or the buses, if they'd get bused, would drop, drop the kids off like at JC Park, and then the teachers would train the kids how to cross the road, how to cross Patchen, because we don't have even a sidewalk on the north side of White Street, right? We did that study and the residents didn't want it, so they have to cross from JC Park, cross over across um, White Street, then White Street across Patchen, go all the way down White Street, um, you know, and there are two curb cuts, two streets there, including Myers Court, and then the crosswalk again, cross over White Street to get to, to get to Chamberlain School. And that was done at least twice per year in my memory, but I don't, I'm, like I said, I don't know what's happening now, but it was to train kids, you know, like I did with my kids. So local motion worked, has worked school by school. Um, in the past with South Burlington, they haven't done a district-wide um, study. Mm -hmm. And the last one that was done was 2012. There two, there's a couple from 2010 and then 2012. So our city has changed a lot and our streets have changed a lot between 2010 and 2012 and now. And to Jesse's point, they're going to continue to change. And so thinking about that um, planning for the future and our current pieces, I think, are really important to continue exactly the types of uh, practices you're talking about. Um, I, I would suggest there are lots of folks in this room who have much more experience than I do in terms of how to put together a, a task force or committee, but I would suggest because um, I think community members and parents are so aware of that this conversation has been happening at school boards and at city council. And there are gonna be, like I said earlier, um, budget implications and, and high level um, accountability and responsibility. I would suggest that we have um, maybe one school board member and one city councilor um, bring together the, the task force. And I would be happy to volunteer myself with the school board um, if we have a city councilor counterpart. And then uh, I don't know how best to coordinate that uh, from there, but I would be eager to hear how that would work. And the school board is, I believe, willing to put this on our next agenda for adoption, if that's the correct process. I think local motion um, facilitates the development of the committee as well. And I think that's sort of their role is to be that, that would be great. expert. Right. And then they bring together our police and our principals um, and our experts. And I, and I think that sort of um, shepherding through the process would bring a lot of legitimacy um, and, and faith in us and our, you know, our, our concerned constituents, um, you know, that we're working through this in a, in a systematic way. Um, you know, considering the educational pieces that we all feel are so important. We have three-year-olds who, when bus 11 is canceled, traverse Shelburne Road alone, right? And three-year-olds, pre-K three students. Um, we have pre-K in all, in all three of our elementary buildings. How is that um, allowed? So wait, let's back up again. Yeah, so yes. Is, uh, How is that allowed? So you have a bus driver problem. We do. Right. We do. That's... I really like to get to the core of what the issue is here because you, yeah. one is you've got a lot of construction going on here. You have sidewalks that are blocked. 
you also have a problem fulfilling all of your bus routes. And that's creating some pressure on some kids to have to walk to school. Is that a correct statement? Because you all have an awful lot of parents that are driving their kids to your schools every day, some of them probably needlessly. But for some reason, either pre or post pandemic or whatever, they've decided that they have to drive their kids to school. Up and down Dorset Street, I see kids jumping into cars, all headed down to the middle school or wherever. So, I, and whereas the bus drives by and it's half empty, I pass a bus, it's half empty. And, and that's a sad thing, right? Because why are we running in buses if not everybody is taking advantage of them because then we have to drive their kids to school. That's a whole other discussion. So I'm trying to understand. So if you have pressures where kids are, are being forced to walk because there's no bus, that's something new that I didn't understand. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. So, um, Tim, it's been difficult. I mean, we have there's a national shortage of bus drivers. There's a state shortage. Um, I think we have been relatively fortunate, as we are in many areas, um, with bus drivers. We're in a position now where we've been able to um, look at student enrollment data um, as recent as the end of September and look at our bus routes and we've collapsed um, four different routes. So we've been able to um, optimize the capacity of each bus. Um, you know, most of our, um, you know, there's one that's very close to capacity, which is 75 elementary students. And that's the Marcotte, uh, one of the Marcotte runs. And um, others that are 50% capacity due to their routes and the timing of getting kids to school. Um, we've also got um, different times of day we, we run buses. So we've got pre-K programs that are all half days in each of our three elementary schools. Field trip runs, um, we have physical education that takes place at um, the edge, right? So buses have a lot of different routes to run during the day um, <laughs> that impact the time. But um, the bus driver shortage has certainly been really difficult. Um, again, nationally, statewide. For us, um, we're in a position now where we could make the operational decision to have a planned cancellation of a route every single day, which would mean that every day someone or some group of, of students can't get to school in either the morning or the afternoon or both. Um, we've decided not to do that. However, um, in the case of Bus 11, who, um, you know, parents have well, really, I'm mentioning this because parents have been really concerned that there are equity issues associated with who are we prioritizing in our bus routes. And so right now, the answer is um, we're, we're prioritizing all students in getting to school without canceling one um, in advance every day. But when, say, bus 11 gets canceled, um, we're in a position where there are a large number of students um, who um, are eligible for free and reduced lunch, whose parents might not be there when they go to school, um, who are members of historically marginalized groups, um, and um, who are people of color. And they have the lowest attendance rates, period, in these early elementary grades, so pre-K, K, one, two, and um, you know, those parents who, it, it's a big equity issue, so those parents who don't have the ability to, um, for whatever reason, get their kids to school when a bus is canceled is something, you know, we need to be sensitive to. Um, it, it can happen to any of our buses, so there's no one more than the other. We try to pull subs together. Um, I think when I sat in this room, actually, um, Jesse had invited me to one of your senior leadership team meetings. And at that time, I think I shamelessly begged for any extra CDL drivers, you know, <laughs> could we have agreements for part-time support? And that's, you know, again, a year and a half down the road, something I would love to explore more, right? How can we work together for sub CDLs even? Um, be that as may. Can I just interrupt to say? Sure. I, I want to make it clear from my perspective, uh, advocating for this, um, for our safer streets and as bike friendly and walk friendly as possible is not an ulterior motive because of our bus shortages. Our buses aren't going anywhere. We're not going to be eliminating our buses. We're always, you know, going to have buses. They have multiple needs and we're always going to have walkers and bikers. And what I'm seeing as a community member, um, and I, I don't have children, so I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have a personal direct state, but 
I see the investment in um, and the expertise of South Burlington in the bike ped committee, in the um, capital improvements, in the, there's been a lot of investment into making our cities as bike and pedestrian friendly as possible. And I don't see our students being prioritized in those conversations. And so it, it's not an ulterior motive because of the transportation shortages. It's because I wanna make sure that the top priority in any investments that we're making to make our city as commutable and um, climate friendly as possible has our students at the start of that conversation and not as an afterthought. It does because we are more and more moving towards protected bike lanes. And even local motion was brought in for Market Street and the design of Market Street and Garden Street. And the fact that we have shared use lanes, not on the road, but off of the road, is specifically thinking about our young people. And same thing with what's happening on the south side of Williston Road. That's going to be a protected bike lane and mixed use path. And that is specifically because we're thinking about young people. People it's want to me that there wouldn't be the same on Shelburne Road where we have Orchard on Shelburne Road. It's a state highway. And um, I will let the, the transportation people take it away. That's we have no control over Shelburne. Okay. Yeah, we have no control. We Here's can a question. Do, do we ask? Do we know? Um, what percent of the students in each school walk, bike, you know, drive, ride the bus? Do, do, do we have that data? Yeah. And, and do, do we know for the kids that get driven, why they're not doing one of the others? What, what do the parents say? What do the kids say? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tim, if you, um, if you can hear me, can I, can I put you on the spot? Do you have any rough understanding of the percentages of uh, students who take the bus? We can, we can. Uh, I, I would hesitate to give you a number right now. I could look it up. Uh, I think that we were talking about 2,000 students being serviced today uh, based upon their registration information. And that would be what's the uh, denominator of that uh, for a total number of students about um, 2600 2600 so yeah that, that's about 77 percent of the 2600 students are registered to take the bus now that doesn't mean they get on the bus every morning especially uh, high school kids who are driving but um that's that's the rough number for the number who have registered to, to transportation services. Thanks, Tim. I, I often, thank you. I often hear so, um, Tim. My goal too is to not have, uh, you know, so many cars driving students on Dorset Street and Marcot. I, I um, we have that shared priority. Um, and, you know, something I'm sure you're hearing from constituents that they bring to me is that they're not comfortable with their students walking or biking. Um, and, and it's the communication I've shared with you, the specific, you know, the major concerns are Dorset, um, Shelburne Road, Hinesburg Road um, are some of the top ones. And parents are citing, you know, traffic, um, Dorset Street, um, it's, um, I hear drivers, you know, all the time when I try to cross, they're like slamming on their brakes, and they're like, sorry. And I think it's just difficult um, visibility to see crossers from the interior three lanes, if you will, if you include the uh, turning lane. And um, so those are the concerns that parents are bringing to me most often is I want to walk or bike or have my kids do it independently. And obviously that varies seasonally too. So those percentages, you know, those 2,000 registered, probably higher in, you know, colder weather. Um, but ultimately, I, you know, I think we could work together to make some progress on putting in some precautions so that we could get fewer cars coming to Marcotte into our middle school. Um, and in order to do that, I think we've got to make some progress on um, making those roads safer uh, to cross, particularly thinking about the, you know, that you, and Megan, I appreciated that you talked about the developmental appropriate um, ways that we teach kids yeah. to cross streets. Elementary school, and there are different questions. Sure, we're very committed to that. Yeah. Um, however, we can all agree, I have a three-year-old at, three at home and I would never let her cross our driveway alone, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, 
Um, and, I, and I think, um, you know, those community members who are in that position have shared that concern. And, and so I do feel a real, a real responsibility to bring that to you today to say, let's move together, you know, work together to um, get some more forward motion um, so that we can get fewer cars on the road, more of our students crossing these busy intersections safely. Well, it sounds to me as if there's some good consensus about creating the task force or whatever you want to name it to start to have those conversations in a, in a very um, specific way around different streets or um, educational um, opportunities and collaboration with the elementary schools and and the middle school and the high school to to do that. That certainly, I, you know, I think everyone would agree with that. I think there the other issues around <clears throat> or the specific issues around Marcotte are a little bit different because this will not be forever. It is certainly problematic. Um, and potentially it would make sense to me to really think about, is there a way we can use the entrance to Williston Road? I mean, I suspect it would have to be a right-hand turn because you're never gonna right. get across that road to right. take a left-hand turn to get out, which for some people it's like, that's not where I wanna go, you know, but that is that is the way you might have to go, but it might help with the, um, the pathway and making it a little less congested um, in this area. I, you know, I, I, I remember the conversations about closing that off, and I think a lot of it was just um, we're going to have this new school street or whatever we, whatever they come up, whatever name they come up with. They haven't named it yet, right? They're, they're so um, they're actually yeah working oh, right. uh, in touch oh, okay. this week, and um, I, I'm laughing. Tim had emailed me once. He said, "What about Lissa Lane?" And I said, "Well, that's a really nice ring to it because <laughs> uh, she's done such a nice job." Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's in the works. Oh, okay. And um, Helen, I I fully support that. I, I think it's terrific. And you know, while we're at it. Um, I hope that a component of this task force can be that we can be planful and working together with the knowledge of what development is planned so that uh -huh. we can sure. um, right now put in uh, precautions that are we're not going to outgrow in two years or three sure. years. And and so I, I look at um, Marcotte and I um, certainly didn't anticipate a few years ago it looking like it did now. And, you know, if I had a time machine, I would have come together with this team and said, hey, what can we do to ease um, the difficulty you know community members are seeing now around um, student safety with the construction and with what's planned ahead I don't know all those details and I would love to be able to troubleshoot uh, with our teams together to say you know what this hot spot will be the new Marcotte in five years so what can we do now and I I think that this is a great way of doing that because the folks on the city team I mean Tom I, I imagine you'd get recruited sure. to be a part of that right yeah no, yeah. I think that would be helpful. That's right. almost a, an additional focus um, for perhaps a different kind of task force. And maybe that's really a, a an internal operational thing for the city. Mm -hmm. We know where the hotspots will be. Yeah. Let's share them with the school department and troubleshoot or think ahead. So what will that need? Is that going to need a, a new cross? walk that we don't have now or crossing guards or you know whatever those issues are well I, I think we know a lot of that from the traffic engineers you know a mm -hmm. lot of these plans are are in 30 right. 60 90 percent design um i think that the challenge what i was trying to highlight is that what we need today to change the perception of a lack of safety and what we need when you know, the boardwalks being built and what we need when we're doing construction on Williston Road is going to ebb and flow. And if we could have a, a team of a task force, a team of champions who are looking at, at that and helping with the um, communication and education and advising on mm -hmm. mitigating factors during construction, mm -hmm. I think that would change the conversation because I quite frankly, I think that the 10 of you elected officials are the ones who and 
Violet and I, of course, and our teams are the ones who are framing the message for the residents. So if we're talking to the residents about this is unsafe, this is terrible, we need all these new things, people are going to feel unsafe. If we frame the, the message as our infrastructure is safe, we are working to incrementally improve it as we always do. We always are thinking about ways to make it better. And if we were doing that in partnership with education and thinking about the iterations that are going to come as our community continues to develop, I think that's really where this group's power comes from is changing those messages. Jesse, I, I, I'm sorry, I really got to respectfully disagree. I, I think there are real safety challenges. I don't I don't think they're perceived and I, I don't think the message is coming from us. I'm hearing from concerned parents who are saying it is not safe to have my three, four, five, six, seven, ten year old cross Shelburne Road. And, ooh, and it's ooh, and then, to cross Shelburne so, Road. So well. I, I, I'm I, saying I, there are real yeah, safety concerns. Shelburne Road can be very intimidating, right? Yes. It, it's a four five it's a five lane road. I don't doubt that. I, I just want to go back a second and say what is not broken. The whole Orchard neighborhood feeder system into Orchard is not broken. It's all just back you know, residential streets that reach all the way up to Stonehenge and, and up to Spear Street if it's safe and all the way up to, you know, Deerfield and that whole area can use bike paths to get to Orchard. There's a lot of, I think, walking and biking that goes on there. The other side, coming from Orchard Park, that's problematic because of Shelburne Road, right? And I think- You could talk about Dorset to our other roads. And, and I, My point is, I think there are are real safety well, just risks. taking one example of something that's that's not sure. broken, right? And I think that probably feeder for Chamberlain in general, with all of the residential areas in there, is not broken in general. This is a little bit more pro problematic because you've got all the construction, and I and I, and I get that. But, but the first question is, I mean, how many kids that are three, four, or five, or six have been crossing Shelburne Road in the past anyway? I maybe this is too yeah, much, you know, granular, you know, conversation for this meeting, but. You know, maybe that's something for the task force. But I, 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 I need, I need, I need an itemized them. list of the yeah. complaints to look at and talk about, and then and argue about, and then and find consensus. And it, and some of them are going to be really obvious, and some are going to be like, "What are you talking about?" If we put this on a city council agenda, mm -hmm. I I'm sure that you will get community members sharing their personal experience. But we could, you know, for the purpose of moving forward together, I think we could, um, you know, look at this from a macro level and say, um, you know, Dorset Street speed limit of uh, 35. Is it 35 in front of the schools? Right, so we could talk about some of uh, Marcotte, right? So we could talk about um, some of the bigger roads, and and um, I think that this team has done a wonderful job of putting a lot of safety precautions into infrastructure in our city. And I I, I don't agree that it's top down messaging that there's concern. I I think it's a grassroots um, that I'm really I'm hearing from constituents that they are concerned and they're bringing new and different concerns to me all the time. And so. You know, it is my role to advocate for that, um, and um, I do think time, there are real concerns. At the same time, if any parent is saying, "I expect my three-year-old child to be able to cross Shelburne Road alone," I don't, that's I don't think that's the expectation. Okay, good, because I yeah, I heard no. that said tonight, and I that I, I was just saying just... some of our youngest students are three. No, I, the okay. I think, you know. We okay. need to be reasonable. No, but but, <laughs> but just you know, trying to close Shelburne Road down to have three-year-olds. But I'm saying but that's what that, you said, and so that's how no, you received what no, you I said. Don't. Okay, so, our youngest, so you know. some of our, uh, some of our. I can. I'm happy to clarify. I, I don't need to be misleading. Um, okay. You know, our youngest students. We started pre-K, and so those are three-year-olds. And so, right. um, but we, that the, doesn't mean that they are alone crossing these roads. I, sometimes it does. It, it, we, then you should be saying, how can we help support this family? Because this family clearly, clearly needs help. We're certainly doing that, right? I mean, there's okay, a good. lot of, absolutely. So there's there's a lot of ways that the school system is supporting families, 100%. I know that. This isn't the that. only way. But I don't think that any crossing guard in the world should be responsible for that three-year-old to get to school. I, I'm, I just want I'm to not, make that clear. I'm not saying that. I'm saying because I that's think asking that, too much. I agree. I just want to make that clear. Okay. okay. So, so my point is is that I think um, if we were to make some. Um, you know, school zone on Dorset Street with reduced speeds. I think that would make it safer for all, right? So, but zooming you, out, not talking about one okay. specific age group. So, so let's just. 
I don't necessarily disagree. And by statute, we need the engineering study, which the council allocated funding to do, which we are in the process of doing. So mm -hmm. we can sit here and talk about those things that we're currently doing and that we've done, the city council has done and Tom's team has done in the last couple of months, or we can talk about how to, with those things that are in progress, come together to talk about all the other things that are also coming. And I think that's what the task force does. I think that's what the yes. task force could do. Right. I mean, because you're right, we are having the studies made, we encourage you, and we're pursuing with as much speed as possible the school zone issues. It's not a something that can happen because we want it to and we say it will and then it happens. It takes some study and some effort and some work and then it can happen. But that's what we're working on. Uh, we're not on different um, uh, positions on that. I, I think the council agrees that school zones, some might be a little trickier. I think Dorset Street is probably a little trickier, but also the kids are a little bit older. So that provides a little more comfort that there won't be second graders crossing that street to get to school. It'll be fifth, sixth and up. So there's a, a little more responsibility or ability to take on that um, activity safely. Yeah. And I would be in favor of 25 miles per hour mm -hmm. on Dorset within that school zone. I, I would be. I think that the cars should be able to slow down there. Oh, I that's reasonable. Well, the Heinberg Road lower too. You know, okay. Okay. we didn't get what we wanted. Well, that's a state route, whereas Dorset. Well, true. Yeah. yeah. I think the issue for some of the intersections is not, you know, does the infrastructure um, provide an adequate level of safety, but a perception is it safe? And some intersections are very complex. And I will tell you, we are not helicopter parents and Allison has said she would let Annie cross a middle school. Kennedy, it's just, it's just too complicated. There's too many cars, too many lanes. Some cars go, you know, make a turn when they shouldn't. There's just too many variables, just too much going on. And I, I'd really love to understand, and maybe this is a survey, how many parents feel that way? Whether it's safe or not, it's about perception. And if parents perceive it to not be safe, they're not gonna send their kids to school on their bike or let them walk and we're not going to accomplish our goals so you know that that you know maybe we need some a survey or feedback like which intersections do parents perceive are not safe because that that's so really what matters. how do you think we change that perception we show them data that says no we have a you're crossing perceiving guard. this incorrectly no, i would have a crossing guard data. i really am not getting royalties for every time i plug local motion tonight i swear <laughs> <laughs> They, they do a lot of surveys. They, yeah. they have a survey structure that feeds into Well, that's the first studies. start. That's so, the start. First step. Yeah. Can I just ask, like, and maybe this is a question for the task force, but on the Dorset Kennedy, I want to, like, zoom out a little bit. So there's a light at the driveway to the middle school, and then there's a light at Dorset and Kennedy. And in between those two lights, there's a crosswalk with a button that you push that has lights uh -huh. for the Which four lanes. Mm -hmm. Why? Like, because those two lights, there's such little space between the two of them. And of course, there's always going to be that traffic that's trying to rush to get through the yellow light at the next or turn right onto the 189. And it's just lights like if you and sometimes those lights go off at different like if nobody pushes up in between that, like sometimes lights go off and there's nobody standing there. And so as a as a driver, I'll look and I'll see I'll be like, OK, there's nobody. But sometimes you can't see because there's cars across the three lanes. I'm just asking like, why is it even an option for pedestrians to cross? And I'm not expecting anyone in this room to know the answer, but like, if you're driving at 35 miles an hour and you stop, I, it just it just seems like- okay. the Tom, course, is right there. I, I don't know the history of why there's two there, um, but- I, my, then, my point is it just seems safer to have people cross at a red light absolutely. than to cross with just the blinky lights on four lanes of traffic. And I, I'm just curious, like, why those are there. So I want to just talk for a minute then, since we focused on that for the moment, about uh, Dorset Street signals and all the work we're doing there. So hopefully folks have noticed the new mast poles and mast arms 
the new buttons, the new lights, the new no turn on red, or actually we used the old ones again, but they were fine. But that's all new uh, with this new stuff, allows us to program things different. So now there's exclusive pedestrian crossing phases. So you push that button now and everybody stops. Well, they're told to stop, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. As part of the well, study, I, mean, I just we signed can't a contract guarantee for that everyone follows. Um, we are looking at development of a school zone there that could come with changes to speed limits that will be within the purview of council once we get the engineering study back. Um, I'm trying to move that along as quickly as possible so we can time that with the kind of part four phasing of paving of Dorset Street. Um, I don't know how quickly I can move these consultants, um, just like we have trouble hiring bus drivers and folks in public works. Uh, consultants are very busy right now, but I did find somebody who's committed to do it on a timeline so we can hopefully move that forward. Uh, we're also going to look at the lights out there in a more systematic way and folks just saying you know, we need more lights or whatever. So I think all of that's in the works. Hopefully, um, I think some of that's in this memo here. I know some of that's in that memo. Folks can read that and see some of those particular improvements, but we're going to look at the crossing. Uh, if we are asking folks to slow down, cars do tend to drive as fast as they feel comfortable. So we have to have some sort of traffic calming in there. Uh, whether that's those pedestrian islands like you've seen on Williston Road. Uh, so something of that nature is going to need to go in as well. Um, I think I've mentioned before how that's a more complex school zone than some of these others. Uh, with complexity comes cost. So I just want to make council aware of that as we move forward. Um, some of these, I'll call them low cost, even though like $40,000 school zones. Um, this one's going to be much more than that. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to have that conversation as well uh, coming up here. I really do appreciate, you know, the work of so many at this table and the communication that, you know, this memo, our letter to the community was really helpful. And, um, you know, off the back of that, um, I, you know, I imagine like you do, or, you know, you've mentioned this will probably be a more complex school zone. So as the city and the council develops, um, you know, your FY25 budget, um, you know, we would just request that, um, whatever anticipated cost for um, the development of a school zone on um, Dorset Street um, be implemented by this team. Do you think it would be helpful? Um, I don't know how active the PTOs are. I'm assuming that a lot of the parents who are members of the PTOs are pretty concerned. You've been hearing how many of them? Yes. <laughs> Maybe not all of them. Yes. And, you know, sharing this information with them in terms of what is happening and a timeline um, and listening to them might be really a helpful way to start some of the education. Yeah, we've been and, and, and changing the perception that, yes, it's pretty scary now, but it sounds like or I didn't know that the, that four way intersection on Kennedy and Dorset will now be stopped in all directions. So you, you can walk as, I mean, nothing is 100%. I mean, someone can have a heart attack and drive up onto the sidewalk and kill your kid. I mean, we can't protect you against that. Right, of course. But, um, you know, things, that kind of information might be really comforting to some of the PTOs. Um, yeah. So that there, it's not just a complaint um, kind of development, but rather, here's what we're doing, and it's in the works. Yeah, we. Um, I've heard, as I said, I, I'm hearing from a lot of concerned parents, and so I've started a, a. I have a weekly newsletter, and I have a section in there on school safety, and I've I've actually linked in um, each time. You know, some folks from this team have written anything. I've linked that in to try to, you know, provide that um, technical information. I did link in the most recent memo from four of you in this room with those updates, um, and um, you know, trying to keep folks updated on what's happening. Um, and the message I'm hearing is it's a a lot of technical information right and so um we can you know certainly work to continue to communicate that um and i think shared communication around that is a real opportunity too for our teams be happy to engage in in any of that um but i certainly am am happy to support that um you know i want our parents to feel safe um and um i, I do think in order for them to feel that way you know they they need to see 
some more changes. And, you know, I've also shared information that that this isn't that nimble process that we so often enjoy. So, you know, tr these things do take time. Um, and I think, you know, for folks to know, yes, we came to a consensus around lighting or traffic monitors or that the council will budget for um, a school zone at Dorset. I think those assurances are ones that I'm really hearing from um, folks on my end. I imagine you're hearing similar ones. I'd love to be able to share that with constituents and, you know, happy to work together with Jesse or Helen or, you know, Kate on any kind of shared messaging. Very open to that. And, and something that then could be taken over by a task force, because that was the ultimate request, right, was that we would have a task force that then would be working on that education piece. Right. Which is so important. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, yeah. and they could report and make recommendations and yeah. for actions for both the school board and the council. Yeah. yeah. You know, based on some good data, some right. good thinking, right. some expertise. Yeah. You know, versus just I got 10, 15 phone calls this morning. Yeah. And you know, people are worried. So is the four-way stop sign system working well? I, um, I, um, I, I'm hearing good things. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, again, we did just lose the traffic monitor there. I, um, you know, that is, um, I think it's slowed traffic and I think that um, there's less confusion about who's going in and out. And again, with my layman eyes, those are just some of my observations on how things are going um, and, you know, greatly appreciate the implementation of those in the school zone, um, all that you all did to do that. I, I think it's um, a, a real step in the right direction. And um, I, if if Lissa were here, I think, or you know, some of the parents whose students go to Marcotte, I think, you know, they would introduce newer, different concerns. And, you know, I um there's still a lot of challenges with crosswalks being blocked, uh, at sidewalks, um sure. and and with the traffic flow. Um and um and really again, changes. you know, if we had when I when I talk about you know traffic monitors through this iteration where we said hey we can do it and now we've just realized we need someone with the skill of directing traffic which we can't offer on our side so um, I'd say those are the main concerns right now at Marcotte. So in terms of the um, you know the flaggers that are that the different construction sites and and paving companies hire and stuff. Um, does, is that something the city can inquire about and find, or the school district can inquire about? So what does it cost to have a flagger or, you know, whatever they're called? I mean, they're not really flaggers, I guess, if they're directing, well, they would be directing traffic, I guess. Or It just seems to me that if the truck drivers express concern yeah. and the construction is, is making this it's on them to do that. It's right. on them to have traffic control on, on Market Street, especially if there are trucks coming and going, because they're coming and going from areas that are not mm -hmm. traffic. They're dumping, they're, you know, they're on the vacant lots and they're coming moving material. But if that hasn't been explored, that's something that might be explored further. Yeah, I can tell you, Larry, um, I looked into um, Green Mountain flagging last year, just out of desperation, and they didn't have staff available at the time. Right, yeah, I mean. They're advertising on TV like crazy. Oh, they're, they're closing sure. down Champlain, you know, Champlain Parkway is, they're moving, you know, they're, they're getting their things done over there. There's lots of flaggers that aren't there right now. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Where are they now? I said send them our way. Well, they're not there now, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, if you can't find a crossing guard, to hire maybe that's another way to go about this but I, I agree with you if it's it's the truck drivers yeah, who yeah. are concerned then you know maybe it's a rightly so I mean they should be concerned and well it would ruin their day if they yeah, yeah be, and their uh, career and everything else no kidding Wendell yeah it's a pure question but are there any of these places you're concerned with <coughs> that aggressive speed bumps would be the best way to go. 
I say it's not a pure question. So speed bumps are one of the things that the um, when we do the traffic studies and the engineering studies that are evaluated as part of that traffic calming that Tom mentioned. So they are one of those tools that are considered in the traffic engineers in the studies. And I'm literally referring to speed bumps, not speed humps, because they're a different <laughs> animal. But I would, you know, I'll put on my other hat. I'll speed I will advocate against the speed bumps and more. See so if you're going to do them, do speed tables. Speed speed bumps are very difficult on fire trucks. Speed tables are much much more manageable. I, I would say I think the the foliar <coughs> stop signs because I I come up and down Marcus Street a lot, and I think it has slowed down the speed on Market Street all the way to Hinesburg Road, even after you go past it. So I think um, it it's done that. I think for the most part, I mean, there'll always be someone who speeds, but um, for the most part, I, it seems like people are really not going over 20 or 25 miles an hour um, in terms of people getting in and out of the school. I try to avoid this street when it's um, drop off or pick up time. Just Which is good. Yeah, I came just on a field trip to find out what was going on but yeah. right people should learn to avoid it yeah I mean, that's kind of the culture and the etiquette that you develop right so. but i think it has slowed things down so in that respect i think it's it's a real plus and i think having a four-way stop at Kennedy and dorset will be because i do a lot of walking and i'll cross that and you know that would be nice I think that would be helpful for a lot of students who are that would be. provided they wait. They can run in place if they're jogging up to their. You push it, run across, and everybody sits here and waits with nobody there. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like going up an elevator on some of the <laughs> <laughs> You've never been on one where someone's done that? Oh, God. Never. <laughs> Pardon me? I saw Bart Simpson do it once. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that would be that guy. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're on it. Uh, I just I want to show the things that some, sorry, some you know, bike walking routes for students um, are, are not, they're not optimized, and they're also not aesthetically interesting or pleasing and they, and they're not that much safe like so for once i used to live in the east was neighborhood and, and once a year when we do a, a you know group walk we walk down um feral street right and there's a cross light there and we take that and we take the bike path back to feral park but then over to lindenwood i think it was right but then we had to walk down shelburne road on the sidewalk there's no alternative to it it's god awful it's the worst <laughs> morning traffic i wouldn't want any kid to have to do that because it's just it, it's Not it's pleasant. a horrible experience to be on that That's sidewalk right. with with hundreds of cars passing you you know and idling and whatnot until you got to one of the side streets you could cut in and get back into orchard school so but there are some routes that just don't lend themselves to being traversed by kids either on bike or by foot there are plenty that are but there are also, also some others which are going to be improved like williston road on the on the which side the south side is going to be improved with a, a better bike lane uh, in the next two years, I think, or, or so. Yeah, I think that's great. And part of you what know. local motion does is they help determine the safest routes to yeah. school with existing infrastructure, yeah. which is really appealing. Yeah. So exactly as you're naming, and we, you know, we want that expertise of saying we can't revise everything in the city. There are places that that are um, shouldn't be walked, and you know, the educational components coupled with the infrastructure, and I think those three together um, is the ticket. And there's always gonna be outliers, right? And there's always going to be uh, accidents. And, um, but I think those are our best bet together. Um, and I think I think if the community sees us working together on that, that will be the assurance they need um, to know. And, and I think that's what changes perception. Um, sure. So yeah, great points Tim. Well, let's get her done. Great. Let's get it set up. Should is take long? A city councilor who'd like to work with you. Well, I, well, well, I think we should um, actually take your suggestion, Violet, and contact Locomotion and have them organize it 
and if if there's a school board member who wants to be on it, I'm sure they would say yes. And I don't know if there's a a council member. Um, I don't I'll know. Do if we, yeah, we, Kate's already been I'll working. Kate's made that connection, yeah. but I think that's I'll do it. That sounds great. Thanks. Thank you, guys. That's great. So, we've well, we'll got a committee of three so far, local motion, and you two, and it can only go be get better. Great. It'd be Thank great you. to have some parents on it. Oh, yeah, it would sure. be. Yeah. You could refer some concerns. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, some Just kind of those areas that are mover and shaker and complainer. Let them get. I would really recommend Nick Anderson. Nick Anderson is on our bike and pet committee, and he is a parent like me. <laughs> he trains his kids oh, right. how to run, run walk and ride. He drive, ride. He's, he's fabulous. He's, the he, he's working. Yeah, yeah he's working yeah. with us on our bike. Yeah. 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 Nick Anderson yeah. is fabulous. Yeah. Great. During the pandemic, they bike to every single utility box that was painted in the city. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. That's one of their projects. That's yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, good. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. So huh. I think this is a great idea. I would love to see this organized with that bike and head committee so that there's yes. a shared list of priorities and we're all on the same page. Yes. I would hate to see something else get developed, which is needed, but then be in conflict with something we're already doing. Uh, we've been working hard to get a process kind of citywide for you know, other non-school uh, related kind of traffic concerns yeah. as well, right? So if we could kind of bring all that together. Um, that would be beneficial. Yeah, more than just yeah. one person. And, and our bike goal, pet. and I would is, agree, as we develop so that's their, this district's bike pet, bike pet committees, we don't want to do it outside of what the city already has. We want to yeah. work together and build on what the city has already put in place. That's very much our hope. We don't, we're not, we're not experts in these arenas, and yeah, we would love to develop what we have in place. Very much build upon that. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. great. Build upon. So um, we haven't certainly finished this conversation, but I think we've um, discussed a lot of values and, and have some actions going forward and we'll, we'll take it from there. Our item seven, unless someone has something else they want to add about the uh, school safety. Um, item seven is discussing future community conversations the two elected bodies want to have in the future. And so I would put that out there and, you know, ask what is it that um, council members and school board members feel would be important to discuss jointly going forward. And of course, one I always feel really, really important is, um, you know, the future um, growth plans and the you know, bonding and, and all the kinds of really infrastructure, big cost items that you have to go to the voters for. Um, kind of having that coordinated is um, is really important. And I, you know, I don't, we don't have those answers right now, but that's something that is um, a future really important in my mind, um, joint conversation about you know, where the entire city is going, not just the city side and not just the school side, but as a whole community. So that would be one piece, but there must be other thoughts people have in terms of um, bigger conversations for both the legislative bodies. No takers? Let me ask a question. So would it be helpful as you think about school infrastructure if there were a more predictable um, growth rate in the city that you do, you know, each year there'll be 90 units, not 300 one year, maybe 100 next year, and 75 or who knows, right? Depending upon what proposals uh, developers get through the DRB. Would, would it be helpful if it was a steady number each year. Predictable kind of. Predictable number. Yeah, it'd be great information as we, you know, tackle school facilities. Our goal is to plan for the community years ahead. So, um, you know, we we reached out to um, get an updated demography report, um, and part of that report, um, Paul Con Connor has been so great. I started working with him when we were um, developing impact fees, and he had some really. Um, good projections, I thought, that he shared with the team at that time. 
and our demographer reached out to him in the development of um, that report um, and found it to be useful. So I think that's a piece of it. Um, but if you know there are folks on this team who have knowledge of different projects or if there's information that would be really critical in yeah. developing. I was going in a slightly different direction because you can only project so much. You don't really know it's going to come through the door, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I saw in the demography report, it said that we're not including things we don't know because we can't, right. obviously, right? So, but a neighboring town, and Megan and I have discussed this, mm -hmm. have explicit growth management, you know, plan, a growth management plan. It's, mm -hmm. it's written in their rules that they, you know, set a cap, which can be lifted for, you know, for certain um, projects that provide significant community, be community benefits. But, you know, th they have a cap, which generally allows them to, to plan mm -hmm. each year. And one of the things that they say as a reason for the cap is to plan for schools, um, among, among other things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it's, it seems to me it might be worthwhile for us to have a conversation around should we be thinking about something similar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what i found interesting yeah. in the discussion the demographics report was that um you know it's also the age and these different the three different school areas and how uh you know the turnover so the chamberlain area is going to be turning over is in the process of being turned over and i saw that central school was getting older right that part so that was an interesting thing too that you can't necessarily yeah. plan on either right so it's not just construction it's also Where? downsizing or you know homes that are been bought by young families right so it's 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 a complex picture and i it reminded me to be to, this is one of my favorite stories of bridget burkhart she came on the school board when the the same demographer was saying well our schools are going to be losing population and she came with her degree and she said let me dig into this a little bit and she did remember alex she did an amazing <laughs> job showing no our elementary schools are going to be cracking at the seams so you know these kinds of reports you always have to take with a grain of salt but i was really um you know, just reminded that you cannot possibly know what the future holds. Right. You know, that's unless you plan for unless it. You plan for it. Yep. Yeah. And we've and I knew more. you were going in that direction. <laughs> it, it, it has not been just this one instance that you refer to, Megan, in which the demographer was not right. accurate. Right. 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 But you can just take a look around the city and see oh, yeah. what's getting permitted, what's going to be permitted green mm -hmm. fields which are going to be broken probably in the next few years and what's mm -hmm. going to go in there and make some pretty good predictions about what types of people will be going there and whether they will have kids or not how many kids they'll have that's what the demographer's job is it, the writing is on the wall yeah. it's going to be a lot of growth unless we control it if you want to yeah otherwise you're going to have to boost the impact fees say so we have to pay we have the tools we, we could right Great. Any other concepts to discuss in the future? Or issues that come to mind? Well, infrastructure generally, right? Put aside growth, but I mean, obviously, yeah. that the 800 pound gorilla is yeah, the middle school, the high school. Well, or, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, the CRP. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, the. Yeah, I know. But and, how, and, how do we you know, progress that? The other people who want a rec center. <laughs> All these things cost money. I would love to to partner um, on a rec center with the city. I think that it's another opportunity for us to share resources. Uh, I know a lot of community members are asking for a rec center, and it was something that was a part of a the proposed um, 2020 bond was a rec center, um, and um, I would love to think about how we might be able to work on that together. Um, I don't think we as a school system can count on 30% funds for construction aid as there may have been in the past. I think it's unrealistic. Um, I'm hearing projections of 10% at best. You know, costs have skyrocketed. Um, at, from the state, 10% from the state. 
potentially. That's it's a soft figure that's been discussed by some business managers, right? So, so I don't know what it is um, or what it will be. Um, I do know that um, you know we our South Burlington schools as a whole, not just our high school, have been named 11th uh, for greatest need in the state. Another way of saying that is 11th most deteriorated, and um, I think there's educational impacts, environmental impacts, um, and I, I do think the heart of every community is a, for me, it's schools, and um, I know a lot of people who come here want the, the quality school system that we offer, so part of that is facilities, and I think for a long time we've been patching um, schools, um, but we will need to make decisions um, shortly um, on, on how to move forward. So it could be as soon as a fiscal year 26 bond, um, you know, potentially um, as we wrap up the ZEMS, we will, um, which was a massive undertaking, <laughs> and I look forward to the completion, um, you know, we'll move our attention toward infrastructure and would love partnership. Um, you know, from you all on that. I, I appreciate the support I've heard from counselors on projects. Um, we've had um, just preliminary discussions about having, um, as was done in 2020, somebody lead some visioning work. So find out what our community wants to do. That would be a first step, you know, an RFP for someone to fulfill that role, working together with, with district and, and city personnel, community members. Um, from there, take that visioning, bring it to life with architectural uh, design and, and moving forward. Um, so it's going to be an in-depth process. I think if there's anything I've learned from the investigation of the 2020 bond work is that the community engagement in the process is the ticket. And without that, and then without the community's understanding, no project will move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm mindful of the cost of these projects too. Um, so... I think, um, you know, one of our, our goals is to, we started a, we were able to allocate some surplus funding to a construction reserve fund. It's our hope this year and our budget that we can have a, you know, a facilities maintenance line. A lot of districts use that. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with that in Winooski. That's something that they did typically about a million dollars annually. It's not been a, a historic practice here at the South Burlington School District, but I think it's a, um, in my opinion, a responsible way that we can start to plan now for the facility needs ahead. Um, but wrapping the ZEMS first, I'm grateful for the community support on those and the room that that'll give our students and then turning our attention to um, the development of an infrastructure committee and engaging our community with visioning. Can I ask a question though? I mean, you all must have thought about this. Post Zims, is the focus going to be on adding on to elementary schools or looking at the high school in particular? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, there was a wonderful committee that was established called the Enrollment Committee. Mm -hmm. um, they brought a recommendation forward June, year and a half ago, to move forward with the Zems. Um, the recommendation with the Zems said move fifth grade to the middle school redistrict so that you even out the population of the middle of the elementary age students and um, at that time have a, um, a rent of build a new high school on the to the east field of the existing middle school staging is important here so at that time you move the high school students to the new school middle school students move to the current high school renovate the middle school that was the idea then in 2020 right well the ZEMS have come to fruition. So it, that was separate from, it was connected. That's why the history there is important. So we've nearly completed the ZEMS. Um, so we've got um, some time before we have over enrollment at the elementary schools. So we need to turn our attention to middle and high school, um, but then it'll come time who knows, based on these demography reports that in the future, we will have to have another elementary school somewhere or make other decisions about elementary schools. If the community doesn't support moving the fifth grade, we would need elementary um, facilities sooner. So uh, up next is certainly the middle and high school conversation. The order in which that happens um, is yet to be determined because we don't know what the community wants to do with fifth grade. So they're they're all they're all interconnected, of course. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I had a question and then it went out of my head. Because um, the the Zems are, are eventually going to, how? what's the lifespan of the Zems? 100 year lifespan. Uh, we had to do galvanized piles, which is a, um, a, um, <laughs> right, right. It's a structural support. Right. So right, right. foundation, um, which reduces so the functional life okay. <laughs> of uh, by 15 years there. Uh, but they We're could the buildings themselves. Well, they could be moved again with if you address the foundation. So um, they're also movable. So they the Zems could be part of a staging process um, if used for middle or high school, yeah. right? The, I uh, wouldn't advise that given the cost of engineering um, and all of the, the you know, rigmarole associated with like <laughs> permitting and design and engineering, mm -hmm. architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was, it was fun watching them come in. <laughs> this was a significant uh, project. So, so, so these could be long term. Are they stackable? I don't know if they're. St I don't. I don't know. Um, they're designed. They're. They're solar ready. So I. That makes me think not. Um, but um, I. I don't know. Double wide, double high. <laughs> double wide, double high. And I remember the the next question. Where are the the hillside uh, folks? Uh, where are their districts? So school. with that question, I would email uh, Paul Connor and he would help me with a map. So the district lines at this point are, are something that um, they're not as predictive as they used to be. So with the, you know, the development, we all know, you know, there are some um, place, there are some neighborhoods in South Burlington where the children go to all three elementary schools. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know um, off the top of my head, Megan, I would, I would, I would reach out to Pay you all for support on that one. Megan, it's inside the, um, the old farm, the old land farm. It is the old farm, yeah. Okay, yeah that's Chamberlain. That is Chamberlain, okay. okay. South of Kennedy Drive and east of Hinesburg Road, I think, is the border for Chamberlain. Okay, okay. Any other? I just want to add a quick piece as we have these, these conversations. Um, I think this is probably more obvious in maybe the thinking about um, school consolidation in much smaller towns throughout Vermont, but I back to you know our, our shared messaging and perception, I, I envision and my philosophy of schools is that they are truly a community resource. And I think that this is particularly apparent as we think about climate resiliency and think about um, communities throughout Vermont who you know lost power or flooded where do we go and we need to gather as a community and when we need emergency shelter and I want us to my vision for um, new and improved school infrastructure is that it's also as climate resilient as possible as aligned you know cutting edge um, with our climate action planning so that you know I, I don't have kids in the district but it's the place that I go you know when my house gets flooded and or when there is a natural disaster that we're going to have to face at some point and um just to have this sh sh truly shared ownership not just i'm a taxpayer i'm paying for the school but also that i am an investor and i see that our school buildings are truly uh, an investment in our community and not just in the kids that happen to be in school right now. So well, we have a citywide emergency plan, and the schools are identified as places to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it includes the school personnel, and there's a lot of training that goes in, and there's a whole network of absolutely who's and in charge and where you go. And, and then Orchard had the um, boiler and the hot water heaters go out this week. So mm -hmm. it's like I want to make sure that our our um, or, so I would make sure that we are resilient as a community, um, which includes the resiliency of our schools. Sure. So with air pollution, like the, the wildfire smoke that we've been seeing, having our buildings beach back ready or mm -hmm. <laughs> even equipped would be. Sure. I, I did. Yeah, that is a kind of a leading into what I could say for number seven is um, I did send to Kate and to Violet and I forwarded to Andrew who's on the climate action task force for the schools that there are schools in Europe that are um, adding HVAC 
adding heat pumps, adding insulation to the outside walls. They have school buildings very much like ours. So there's, you know, you could just add things to the outside of the walls and, and make thicker walls that are insulated for $7 million. That is very reasonable. Uh, and they're, they're net zero afterwards. And these are schools on that, like at the failing for, for energy um, efficiency. So there are, there are solutions out there when we talk about, you know, looking at ways to make our buildings, you know, truly top notch in terms of the environment that are not necessarily costly. We don't have to tear down and rebuild. We can, we can reuse. Uh, so I really hope that we can have that kind of conversation too. Uh, even 577, same kind of building. Mm -hmm. You could just add to the outside um, and you could, you know, put in the HVAC and the heat pumps and off you go. I mean, it would obviously need to have an engineer. It's not me just saying it. And yeah, I'm, I'm, it very, I'm very interested in making those improvements and, and um, happy to discuss environmental um, improvements district-wide as one of our main um, goals of the climate action team that we've just developed. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any other business? Here. This is my first in-person steering committee meeting, so I just want to thank you guys. It's really nice to have these conversations. Well, I think in-person, I mean, Zoom is terrific if you're sick or as a public member and you just want to listen in, but certainly face-to-face -face conversations, I think, are the most effective. Sometimes they take more time, but I think they're a little more effective and um, I appreciated learning a lot about even some of my fellow counselors things I didn't know so um thank you very much for and we miss Laura tonight I don't know she's at, she I can share publicly she's she's working she's at um parent teacher conferences she's an educator and so she was unable to be here this evening um but since her regrets and um is um you know we'll see her next time we can we'll we'll send her the link <laughs> okay thank you so much everyone. so if there's no other business um motion to adjourn so second all in favor aye, aye. aye. thank you very much thank you. Thank you.